What up, though? Part 2 After the war ended, slavery was also ended, but many former slaves stayed where they were. They didn't want to leave their homes. My great-grandparents stayed, stayed on in their small log house on the Wright's land and continued to work for the family. Life was not very different from before but they knew they were free to leave if they wanted to. I wish you let us know if they were free to leave before slavery ended. They also had the right to purchase land. I don't know how or when they did it, but sometime after emancipation, my great-grandparents purchased 12 acres of land that had been part of the Hudson Plantation. So after they, after slavery ended, after labor, work, employment ended, her great-grandparents were able to purchase 12 acres of land During the day, my great-grandfather made furniture for Mr. Wright, his former master. He was using Mr. Wright's tools, his former master, his former supervisor, his former manager. After emancipation, my grandmother moved into the house with the Wright family to take care of their child. She wasn't much older, older than six but she was large enough to take care of a small child. She didn't have to go out in the fields to work and did not have much work to do around the house either. My grandfather had a somewhat belligerent attitude toward whites in general, and he liked to laugh at whites behind their backs. My grandfather did not want my brother and me to play with white children. The white overseer of the Hudson plantation had some children just about my age and my brother's age. When we wanted to play with them or when they wanted to play with us, grandfather would be very hostile. He made us stay away from them. Any little thing he could do, he did. It wouldn't be anything of great significance but it was his small way of expressing his hostility toward whites. The whites never did anything to him because of his attitude. He and my grandmother married very young, and the one thing he wanted most of all was for none of his children or anyone related to him to ever have to cook or clean for whites. He wanted all his children to be educated so they wouldn't have to do that kind of work. Domestic work paid very little, and those who did domestic work were not respected. That's why my grandfather wanted my mother to become educated and teach school. Teaching was a prestigious job, and it paid more. My grandfather and grandmother had three daughters. Fanny did just what my grandfather didn't want. She left home and went to work in the city of Montgomery in white people's house and white people's homes. Maybe she wanted to make some money right away. My mother, Leona Edwards, went to school in Selma, Alabama at Payne University. She didn't go long enough to get a bachelor's degree, but she did get a teaching certificate. I liked being with my grandparents. Sometimes they would take me fishing at a creek on the plantation. I always believed that the fish should see the worm, see that worm moving on the hook and that they'd bite a lively worm much sooner than a dead one. People used to use other things besides worms too. 
like fat meat and crawfish tails. One day when I was about 10, I met a little white boy named Franklin on the road. He was about my size, maybe a little bit bigger, a little bit larger. He said something to me, and he threatened to hit me, balled his fist up as if to give me a sock. I picked up a brick and dared him to hit me. He thought better of the idea and went away. My grandmother remarked that I was too high strung and that if I wasn't careful, I would probably be lynched before I was 20 years old. I didn't have too many other run-ins with white children. Mostly, white children kept to themselves and black children kept to themselves. We went to different schools and different churches and came into contact with each other only once in a while. My brother was a larger child than I was, and he and I were always close in size. There were times when we were small that he weighed more than I did. He had eyes that were kind of slanted, and he looked almost oriental. When he was 13 or 14 years old, there was a man who used to come by and call him Chink. I was already reading when I started school. My mother taught me at home. She was really my first teacher. At recess, the girls would play what we called ring games. The boys would play ball. I don't think the girls played much ball at school. We used to play at home a little bit. <clears throat> we called what we played baseball. I wasn't too active in it. I wasn't very good when it came to running sports. Some of the older boys at school were very good at running sports and playing ball. They were also the ones who were responsible for wood at the school. The larger boys would go out and cut the wood and bring it in. Sometimes a parent would load a wagon up with some wood and bring it to the school, and the boys would unload the wagon and bring the wood inside. They didn't have to do this at the white school. The town or county took care of heating at the white school. I remember that when I was very young, they built a new school for the white children, not very far from where we lived. And of course, we had to pass by it. It was a nice brick building and it still stands there today. I found out later that it was built with public money including taxes paid by both whites and blacks. So even at that time, she seemed, she seemed to, well, I don't know if she was complaining about the fact that they had to bring the wood in and heat their own school. Um, what I gather from it is that they were taking care of themselves um, self-sufficiency. I'm not sure if she complained at that time, but during the writing of this autobiography, it seems that that was a point of contention. My mother told me stories the old people had told her about slavery times. I remember she told me that the slaves had to fool the white people into thinking that they were happy. The white people would get angry if the slaves acted unhappy. They would also treat the slaves better if they thought the slaves liked white people. My mother told me stories the old people had told her about working times, about employment. I remember she told me that the employees had to fool the white people into thinking they were happy. The white people, the employer, would get angry if the employees were unhappy. They would also treat the employees better if they thought the employees actually liked them. In other words, I didn't see any drinking fountains marked colored and white. I was six 
At the time, I didn't realize why there was so much Klan activity, but later I learned that it was because African-American soldiers were returning from World War I. Again, African-Americans, I'm not sure why she's using that terminology to describe them, her and her people at that particular time. Af African-American soldiers were returning from World War I and acting as if they deserved equal rights because they had served their country. The whites didn't like blacks having that kind of attitude. So they started doing all kinds of violent things to black people to remind them that they didn't have any rights. My grandfather kept his gun, a double barreled shotgun, close by at all times. My grandfather wasn't going outside looking for any trouble, but he was going to defend his home. I remember thinking that whatever happened, I wanted to see it. I wanted to see him shoot that gun. Rosa was a little G. Let's shake it. I was young and hadn't done much reading about racism. Of course not. But I did a lot of listening. I heard a lot of black people, okay, here we go, black people, being found dead and nobody knew what happened. Other people would just pick them up and bury them. That was nice of them. My grandparents were the only black people. I, only if, well, maybe or maybe not. Um the importance of using the proper terminology or terminology that's based in reality. I don't know if people understand the importance of that because to keep saying African American and then say black and then on your census records, it says that you were mulatto. It, it's, it's very confusing to some. My grandparents were the only black people on that plantation who owned land. They had 18 acres. 12 acres were inherited from my great grandfather, James Percival. Y'all remember James Percival from part one? James Percival, who she said was a Scotch Irish who came over on a boat, um, indentured servitude. And on the census record, it said, um, it spoke to the contrary. It said that James Percival was actually born in North Carolina and James Percival's parents were born in America. 12 acres were inherited from my great grandfather, James Percival, who purchased the land for himself and his wife, my great grandmother, Mary Jane. The other six acres were given to their daughter, my grandma rose to live on as long as she lived. Wow. Us who are termed black Americans slash African Americans, properly Americans. The, this is the bane of our existence. The, passing down of land, of soil, and all the self-sufficiency that comes with that. Your own water source, growing your own food, managing your own waste, providing your own fire for cooking and for heat and for light. Let's shake it on our land, on our land. This doesn't sound oppressive to me. At this point, I'm asking, let me know. Does this sound oppressive to you? On our land, but this is what is being was being pushed for a long time, a movement even. When there's no victimhood here, 
on our land, we had fruit, pecan, and walnut trees. We maintained a garden and raised chicken. Oh, wow. Speak about self-sufficiency. On our land, we had fruit, pecan, and walnut trees. You know, pecans and walnuts, um, a pound. Whew. 10 to $15 today. Fruit. We maintained a garden and raised chickens and had a few cows. They got eggs, chicken, all sorts of beef. We didn't have to buy many things at the stores, unlike you. Right? My grandfather was the one who usually went to the stores, but sometimes my brother and I would rule, would ride in the wagon with him. He would have eggs for sale. And he would trade the eggs for whatever else the family needed but didn't have. He also sold chickens and calves. The stores had many things, had most everything we needed, including cloth. I don't remember ever getting any ready-made garments in Pine Level. But we could buy cloth and my mother would sew for us. Another branch of self-sufficiency is making your own clothing as well as your own dwellings, which, which <clears throat> Rosa's father built homes. <laughs> we have come a long way. And some people even would say evolution or as we should be saying devolution, devolution, when we finished working on our land, we used to work in Moses Hudson's field. Mr. Sherman Gray was in charge of the field hands. We never called him anything but Mr. Sherman on Mr. Sherman or Mr. Gray because he was an older man and we respected him. People used to call him the top nulla. <laughs> wait, wait. They worked for the top nigga. You understand? So when you talk about all this so-called slavery and employer, employee, understand they had their own land and they was working their own soil. But they went and worked for the top nigga. You understand? To make some paper, to make some scratch. I was a field hand when I was quite young. A field hand. She has two hands. I have two hands. You have two hands. I was a field hand when I was quite young, not more than six or seven. I was given a flour sack like the other children and expected to collect. I was a field hand when I was quite young, not more than six or seven. I was given a flour sack like the other children and expected to collect. Let's cut to on the topic of land. They had their own land. They had fruit, pecan and walnut trees. They had a garden, raised chickens, cows. He, the grandfather used to trade calves for things that they did not have. They didn't need much from the store. It was probably fun for the shouties. Rooters. U.S. black farmers lost $326 billion worth of land in the 20th century. Lee Douglas, 2022. <clears throat> Black farmers in the United States lost roughly $326 billion worth of acreage during the 20th century, according to the first study to quantify the present day value of that land, of that loss. Land loss is a contributor to the racial wealth gap in the United States. Until you start going to school and becoming teachers and this and that and, um, then the land no longer really means as much as it used to because you don't want to labor for yourself. You rather slave labor for another. 
wealth and land is one is is one way in this country that you're able to grow opportunity for your family, said Dr. Danya Francis, professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and lead author of the study published on Sunday in the American Economic Association's Papers and Proceedings Journal. The study calculated the compounded value of declining acreage owned by African Americans, properly Americans, between 1920 and 1997 in the 17 states where almost all black owned farms were documented using data from the USDA Census of Agriculture. This is not just theoretical, but this is empirical, said Dr. Derek Hamilton, economics professor at the New School and another of the study's authors. These are real losses that occurred. In 1910, black farmers owned more than 16 million acres of land, according to experts. In 2017, when the most recent agricultural census was done, that figure was just 4.7 million acres, about 0.5% of all farmland. This is from Fair Farms, A Brief History of Black Land Ownership in the U.S., March 2021. The loss of land ownership and rights dates back to the mid 19th century, where in some states, black Americans were prohibited from owning land after the Civil War ended. The Emancipation Proclamation did not guarantee a right to land ownership. Black farmland ownership steadily increased in the late 1800s and hit an all time high national average in 1910 when 14% of all farm owner operators were black Americans. This decades following the civil war accumulated 19 million acres of land. During this reconstruction period, black land owners purchased every available and affordable plot of land that they could. Well, my land that, well, my land grandma, Between 1910 and 1997, African-Americans lost about 90% of their farmland. One of the main causes of this property loss is heirs' property, where descendants of landowners inherit land from their family but have no will or legal documentation that proves their land ownership. I was thinking, if you're a person that is self-sufficient and you live off the soil that you sprouted up from. When would it be appropriate for you to say that you own that soil? Because a fence is put around it, that means now you own the earth. From the 1920s to today, the percentage of black land owners steadily dropped from 14 percent to only 1.3 percent across the nation. In 1997, John Boyd Jr. and 400 other black farmers sued the USDA in the landmark lawsuit Pickford versus Glickman. This case was settled in 1991 with the government distributing $50,000 each to over 16,000 farmers. Nothing. Nothing. $50,000 in fiat currency. A big pile of cotton and linen promissory notes. Her grandfather used to go to the store and he used to trade calves and eggs and chickens and things that they grew for things that they needed. It was even. It was cut and dry. It was clean. And see, 
when you talk about integration and segregation, people are not, it's not that people were segregated. You mess with who you mess with. Now, us as, as beings, people will naturally come together and become cool with one another. But when you force someone to be cool with someone else, regardless if they ever come in contact with one another, just the idea that they're, they're forced, they're being forced to do things that they don't want to do, that they didn't suggest, this is where the problem starts. And the proponents, the pers the people who are the face of these of these acts should be held accountable. And um, maybe they were. Let's shake it. During Tom Vilsack's eight year term in the Obama administration, fewer loans were given to black farmers than during the Bush administration. You would think by um, Rosa Parks, she kept mentioning African-Americans. I mean, Obama is an African-American. He's African and um, he, he lives in America. So I guess that's what what it takes to be an American these days is all you have to do is live here. Moving along back to Rosa Parks, my story. She was given a flower sack. And she was going to pick two pounds of cotton. We would make it a game by seeing who could pick more. When I grew older and stronger, I picked cotton sometimes and chopped cotton at other times. She said we was making it a game. Some of y'all might think, oh, she's so the poor girl. She don't know. She don't know that she oppressed. She don't know that she may be made a fool out of. She said she was five or six. At five or six, what was you doing? You were slobbing. Your nose was running and you were slobbing, man. Let's shake it. We were paid 50 cents per day for chopping cotton and one dollar per hundred pounds of pack of picked cotton. Hmm. So they was making money. They was working. They was working young. I worked young. I was working as a shorty. When the time came that my taste got a little bit too expensive, I had to go, you know, make a couple dollars on my own. And it was a young age, it was nine, ten years old. I remember thinking about that and also thinking about another man who was our neighbor. He had a big family of children, too. And he was a completely unmixed black man. Now, what does that mean? A completely unmixed black man um, I have no idea what this means let me try to read it again he was a completely unmixed non-existent man no white blood at all very confusing he was an older man named or okay I got it he was dark brown he was an older man named Mr. Gus Vaughn. His wife and children worked in the fields, but Mr. Gus Vaughn didn't do anything but walk around on his stick. <laughs> he was the head of the household and his family was working. And uh, with Miss Parks telling his story later on in life, I'm pretty sure it's very difficult to remember when she was five or six as it is with any of us. Um, when you were five, there were still 365 days in that year. How many of those days do you remember? 24 hours in a day. She said he didn't do much. He walked around on his stick. It was his soil. He was doing other things. She just don't remember. And it fits the, the, the picture of People slaving. It kind of fits that picture. 
But as we can see here, there is no European, no pink or gray European masa. It's Mr. Gus Vaughn walking around with his walking stick. He didn't do anything but walk around with his stick and talk big talk. Later on, when I heard white people say that it was the light-skinned black people who had the courage to stand up to whites, I'd always think back and remember Mr. Gus Vaughn, who had no white blood. Now, I know she's speaking about her younger self. But she said, I'd always think back and remember Mr. Gus Vaughn, who had no white blood. How, did she know his genealogy? Did she know Mr. Gus Vaughn's parents and uh, four grandparents and eight great grandparents? How did she know? Because he was dark brown. Not all the white people in Pine Level were hostile to us black people. And I did not grow up feeling that all white people were hateful. When I was very young, I remember there was an old, old white lady who used to take me fishing. Oh, old, old white lady used to take her fishing. She was real nice and treated us like anybody else. She used to visit my grandparents a lot and talk with them for a long time. Thanks for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed part two of the six part series from Rosa Parks. Tad, her feet hurt. Do the right thing.